Okay, so we will pick up the others as they arrive. But I'm going to start us with an arriving practice. I know it might seem strange, we've arrived hours ago, but do you know that sometimes that feeling of not quite having got your body, mind and breath in the room? You know, sort of letting go of what's come before, letting go of what's yet to come, and just maybe feeling your support of your chair underneath you, behind you. The feeling of your feet in contact with the ground. And the feeling of your breath coming and going. Arriving. Letting your mind be here with your breathing body instead of on the next thing that's yet to happen or the shopping list. You know that thing that mind does, it goes off. Let me just bring it back. I mean, there's no right, there's no wrong. You could just invite it back to feel the breath as you inhale and exhale. Feeling welcome. And acknowledging the company that we're in, a very high caliber company we have here today. Bunch of human beings doing life. You know, that sort of, there's no divide between the patients and the professionals in the room. We're all just humans breathing. Please do breathing. Grounding, settling. And existing in this space that is in between. We're in a transition. You might notice your mind's already wandered off. Mind's been wandering off onto the land of Zoom. It's wondering where everybody is. But, you know, I could just bring it back. Back to my head and my body and my feet on the ground. Just practicing. It's all right, there's nowhere to get to and you can't get it wrong. It's more kind of about being than doing. I know you might think that I'm here to do something, but it turns out, I'm just being, I just happen to be telling you the inner workings of my being at the moment, which involves breathing all the way in and all the way out. And the mind will come and go. That is simply the nature of the human mind we're not here to tuck our fingers at it. It's part of our evolution. So we invite it back. Mind, body, breath. Don't touch the microphone. And we listen, we let the sounds arrive into our ears. You don't need to chase them down. They'll come to your ears and they arise and they fall away. The buzzing, the humming, the sound of my voice. And then the mind wanders and it has a story and it interprets something or a whole narrative about a sound. And you think, actually, we could drop the judgment drop the story even and just feel the sensation of the sound that rises and falls. Feeling the, the sensations that the sounds create, the sensations of light coming in through our eyes, maybe even the texture of uh, clothing on the skin. So this this is a bit of mindfulness. I'm curious. Anyone ever done a practice that had anything like this in it before? Can I get a hand? Like, you know, some of you have met it. It's a friend. It's an old friend. I say I don't like public speaking, but I love mindfulness. And I love sharing mindfulness. How about the self-compassion? Have you heard of that? <coughs> Not so many. That one's catching up. That one's kind of coming in, it's joining the mindfulness. 
we got some people with us. Welcome to the people who are in their rooms, who are not in our room, but have just arrived into our room. We've been doing an arriving practice and you might be wondering where we've been. We lost you in cyberspace, we're terribly sorry. But please join us in arriving. I suggested to the people in the room, they might like to feel their body supported by the chair or their feet on the ground. They might like to let go of whatever's just happened because there's this moment, the one that's right here, right now. Oh, and you know, bring the mind back from what's coming next because actually it might just wanna arrive arrive and feel welcome, settling into your seat. Settling your breath. And when the mind wanders, you can just acknowledge that that's perfectly natural and come back to the breathing body. So I've already told you a tiny bit about me because I'm not a public speaker. I did train as a psychologist. I love mindfulness practices and sharing them. So I'm kind of here as a fellow human being. It's the Breast Cancer Care WA folk who've uh, invited me here and I'm really grateful to them. Where's that button? Yes, they support me and my work and I'm glad to be here to support them. And I would also very much like to acknowledge my mindfulness teachers here in WA, but also in Scotland where I trained. And we need to acknowledge that, you know, we're riding on the shoulders of thousands of years of traditional contemplative practices that occur across all cultures. And that's the foundation of what we can practice here in Perth in 2021. So I always like to let people know this is the best quote I've ever come across on order Balzac. There is nothing original, all is reflected light. So I'm not coming here to tell you things that I made up or thought of myself. I'm sharing things that belong in history, that belong in other people's practices, but I thought it might be nice if we put them all together with each other today. Reflect some light. So just checking, there were a few hands and I asked mindfulness, where is it already in your life? You know, did someone do a course? Hands up if you've done a course. Yeah. And um, do you still practice? And oh, how do you practice? Like, what's your practice? Do you, do you hold your cup of tea in the morning and feel the warmth of it in your hands? Or do you, do you actually do formal practices? Anyone willing to? The tea in the hands. The walk with the dog? Not both hands. You know when you go walking? Oh, when you're mindful eating? Is anyone doing lengthy practices or are you just doing short ones? Anyone lying, like doing a body scan for 30 minutes? Oh, you do the sleep one. It's such a helpful transition. Oh, okay, sleep. I'm not doing very well with the whole microphone thing. I think I'm going to run poor Emily ragged. Sorry. Um, we've got examples of eating. I was giving the cup of tea one. And then... The time before bed, you know that transition where you're like, go, 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 and then you need to change gear to down-regulate to be able to sleep. Mindfulness can really fit in there. It could be a long one or a short one. Um, I've actually purchased an Oculus oh. virtual reality headset. Wow. And uh, there's lots of guided meditations on that. So you're still looking, you're not closing your eyes. So there's still a, a visual input, but it's really awesome and um, loopy. And... and and will you be here afterwards to tell us about this product if we need to get more information? Because yeah, this sure. sounds so interesting. Yeah, sure. That idea of using our senses, but the idea of actually virtual reality might meet us there and uh, support that process. You don't need a fancy machine though, by the way. I don't know if you noticed, but... We can do it here and, you know, just with the sound of my voice and an audio recording, or you can do it in your own mind. Have we got another question coming up over here? Thank you. A comment. Yeah. Thank you. So you were saying you could have that, um, you can buy the product or you can listen to your voice. But for everyone, if you go online, there are thousands and thousands and thousands 
literally of free mindfulness sessions, guided meditation, guided mindfulness, mindfulness for the children, mindfulness for yourself, mindfulness for the family. It's all there and it's all free. So you just go to your find your site that sorts you out or what your family she out. Said but it's all there. That you totally can. Thank you. One more? No. It is out there in cancer care as well. So uh, Linda Carlson and her team in Calgary popped something together um, as a mindfulness-based cancer recovery. And, you know, that's because the research is really going exponentially in this field. We're getting improvements in the stress, the biomarkers for stress and arousal, heart rate, blood pressure. And there's also people self-reports around their mood, their anxiety, stress, resilience, quality of life. In the cancer cohorts, they were showing a preservation of telomere length. Now, I'm not a doctor. I don't know where my telomeres are. I was like, oh, at the ends of my chromosomes, apparently, they tend to kind of wear out and they kind of degrade a bit as we get older. So it's a um, normal process of aging. So if they're preserved, we might actually be reducing some of the wear and tear of aging. It's like it's not curing cancer. I'm not trying to pretend this is really um, like a kind of, miracle solution but the idea of supporting the well-being of the body and the kind of um, nervous system you know that makes sense and there's a lot of brain imaging research now um, they show that our brain's different we're not in our default mode network where it's just all about me 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 it's more kind of um, able to be engaged in the world so there's a bunch of um, books and resources I've put a few of my favorites up um, John Kabat-Zinn is the one that's credited mostly with bringing a lot of this practice from the East to the West, from the traditional practices to the modern. And his definition of mindfulness is that it's an awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. That's the tricky bit, right? It's so easy to listen to my breath and think, oh, it should be quicker or it should be slower or to pay attention to my body and think, oh, I wish it didn't, you know, have all its sprinkles in it. And you think that's not non-judgmental. The non-judgmental bit, I think, is a really interesting point where it crosses over with the self-compassion, which has also been coming across. Weirdly, we managed to import mindfulness and then we went back and got self-compassion and then we realised there were like two wings on the same bird. It doesn't fly without them. So we've got some nice researchers like Kristen Neff and Chris, um, Chris Germer giving us definitions where we've got self-compassion is giving ourselves the same kindness and care that we would give to a good friend. So, you know, that idea of compassion, this is a Compassionate Mind Foundation. It's like we have this sensitivity to suffering in the self and in others, and then a commitment to try to alleviate and present, prevent it. Now, you might not get there. It's not, this is not about the outcome, but it's that sense of being motivated to care, to reach out to someone, and also reaching out to yourself like you would if you're your own, own best friend. Mindfulness also translates as heartfulness. Um, it has a quality of warmth. You know, it could just be bare awareness. There's lots of stuff out there called attention training, which is great. It's really nice. But I also think, you know, maybe we could bring the heartfelt bit back in, the compassion, strike a balance between meeting things with things just as they are but also cultivating qualities of care and kindliness and you know, maybe even clarity of mind. So if mindfulness is inclusive of compassion, we can also cultivate compassion if we make it our intention. So I'm just going to take us into another little mini practice and I'm going to get you to pay attention to your body again. And this time, just notice how your weight is distributed along the chair and through your feet on the floor. And asking yourself, could I be more comfortable? Is there a way of taking care of myself? And you might find that actually the answer is that you need to stand up. You need to turn your chair so that you don't have to crane your neck. Or flip it around so you can lean on the back of it. Clever, right? Or get up and change chairs. I don't mind if you want to walk around the room. This is not a kind of torture session, by the way. This is like qualities of compassion, kindness taking care of yourself. So shift your weight, just do it really mindfully. We're not trying to be, um, you know, all still and stiff. You might even just feel 
the weight shifts like from one butt cheek to the other. You know, it's like, oh, maybe my head wants to move and I'm just shifting weight. I can do this in a meeting or I can do it in the waiting room, waiting for an appointment, just taking care of myself. It's a little mini movement practice, but you know, it saves me giving you a whole yoga session. I think the other thing I wanted to refer to is that there's a continuum of mindfulness. We can do the formal practices. Thank you to our lovely lady who's pointed out that we can access all of that online. You know, you can lie and have someone talk you through for half an hour, sitting, walking. But then there's the informal stuff. I'm kind of throwing it at you just now. And then there's the spontaneous moments, you know, like when you see the bee land on the flower and you're like, oh. and just right there, that's all there is. And then it's kind of gone again, really spontaneous. They string together a bit like beads all different shapes and sizes but the thread that links them is our intention so I have to kind of connect to why I'm doing all these practices I might be doing it to support good sleep I might be doing it because I want to cultivate some compassion and I might be doing it because I actually just need more patience in my life or maybe in a bit more a way of relating to things that come and go because otherwise I try and control them and I set up lots of tension for myself so when I begin any practice, whether it's just taking a walk and being intentional about, okay, what am I doing here? But then you just let it go. You're not here like bashing away to create compassion because that wouldn't be very compassionate, right? So don't go at it like a mission, just hold it lightly. We can do another little formal practice. We won't do the sitting, the breathing. That's all online. We'll just do a little body scan. So come into your breathing body and allow your attention to move to the soles of your feet. And let your attention move as if from the inside out, through the toes, through the insides of the feet, tops of the feet and the heels, the ankles, the lower legs and the knees. And letting go of judgment letting go of the idea that there's a right or a wrong and just allowing your attention to be in the knees. Nothing to find. Nowhere to, nowhere to go will be just here in this moment as you move your attention into the upper legs. The thighs, the hips and the buttocks. the pelvis, the soft belly at the front, and around to the lower back, the sacrum and tailbone, and all of the vertebrae of the spine, one stacked above the other as you move up through the back of you. Moving your attention around the ribs, under the arms, and to the breastbone at the front. Feeling all the subtle movements of the torso as you breathe. The lungs filling and emptying the heart beating, the quality of warmth, feeling the shoulder blades at the back and the collarbones at the front. Again, rising and falling in time with the breath. The shoulders and arms. the upper arms, elbows, forearms, wrists and hands, 
fingers and thumbs. There's two arms connected into the breathing body. And moving your attention up through the neck. The vertebrae of the neck. The sides of the neck. And the front of the throat. The head balanced the skull and scalp and the skin on the face. Eyes resting in their sockets. Tongue resting in the mouth. Letting go of tension that might be accumulated around the jaw. And allowing sounds to come and go in your ears. Light to come in and out through the eyes. The whole of the head, the whole of the body, the whole of you, breathing. I'm just taking another full breath there, all the way in and all the way out. And I'm going to invite you back into the conversational space, but feel free to stay with your body. It will be there. You can dip in and out. So I think it's a bit like skills training. If you want to learn to play football, you've got to go to training, right? You don't just go to the games, you kick the ball. Sometimes you win the ball don't really necessarily know how to work together you know the ball doesn't always go where I kick it or I think I'm kicking it but the more I kick it the more I get familiar with oh that's where that goes so if I do these drills little practices like this short or long they might be available for me when I'm out playing the match for real and this time the match is real life right the drills set the scene for mindfulness to arise and I'll have to say not everyone finds the mindfulness practices calming if there is any agitation in your system or something that's sort of grumbling away in the background, it will come to the foreground. So sometimes people say, oh, that wasn't very pleasant. Ah, I have whole practices where I met with my agitation or my irritability. And don't let that worry you. It's all just part of the practice. Sometimes it's quite pleasant. And, you know, that also keeps, kind of keeps me wanting to practice. I thought I would uh, introduce you to some even briefer practices. I mean, that was a brief body scan, but there's a breath. Oh yeah, and the pause. I'll do it through them one slide at a time. The pause, this one I like, do it a lot in the hospital because sometimes it's just really hard to stop. Do you know what I mean? Like you just don't get a chance to stop. You're still doing something. Your brain's still thinking about something. But if I say to myself, pause, that can be really powerful. You know, maybe just before you answer the phone, so we're always so grabbing everything. Or maybe it's like after you finish a task, you do something at home and you just pause. It helps us be able to respond rather than react. So Viktor Frankl, Holocaust survivor, writes about the fact that between a stimulus and a response, there's a space. If we can slow things down, we can get that space. So he goes on to say in the space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So something quite powerful about pausing. Pamela Druckerman talks about the way in which French and um, American parenting looks different and that a lot of the time she'll see the French mums will pause. Just take a moment to see what's happened. Like if their child calls out, American mothers were more likely to <laughs> swoop in. And again, don't get me wrong, you want to swoop in if the child's in the middle of the road. But if they've just toppled over and they're trying to work out how to get back up, they might do it themselves or you might go and help them. But the idea of being able to choose your response rather than just be kind of compelled, I think is a really helpful thing for all of us. And Thich Nhat Hanh, he gives us this practice, it's just one breath. So just try it with me, breathing in. I know that I am breathing in. 
and breathing out. I know that I'm breathing out. So just say those words to yourself in your head, in your own time, because your breath and my breath might not go at the same speed. Breathing in. I know I'm breathing in. I'm breathing out. I know that I'm breathing out. You could add the image of a wave, you know, let the breath be like the wave across the sand where it rises up. And it seems to pause just momentarily, neither in nor out, turning, then flowing back into the sea, from which another wave arises. So you can always catch the next breath. If you miss the last one, that's fine. There's always the next one. And then this distinction, mindfulness, it's a moment-to-moment -moment awareness of the experience with an attitude of kindly curiosity. And self-compassion is moment-to-moment -moment awareness of the experiencer with an attitude of kindly curiosity. So to add a little bit of uh, compassionate breathing practice, I'm just going to allow you, or oh, invite you, allow you, no, it's you allowing me. Please, I invite you to tune into your breath. Now you might detect your breath at the nose or the mouth or the chest or the belly. And it really doesn't matter. Just finding a place where you can go, ah, yes, that is the inhalation. And that is the exhalation. And feeling the expansion of the inhalation and the release of the exhalation. You might even be able to detect there's a little bit of movement. You might sway a little like a breeze in the branches of a tree in a light wind. And you might detect a, an expansion of the body around the breath. And then if you have the idea of releasing, you might feel that little contraction. So just let your breath rock you as if from the inside out. It might even caress you offering a kindly presence, even allowing your breath to help you settle. It's like an affectionate breathing. This is a self-compassion practice. It's not always a easy, Thing to offer us self-compassion but actually if we can do it through the breath it might just be a little entry point so you can stay with that for a little longer and you can join me in the next one this one adds the hands so keep breathing don't stop breathing keep breathing but yeah just put your hands in front of you if you can be comfortable you can still have them quite well supported in your shoulders and just on the inhalation the hands would expand Like this. Oh, hang on, blinded. And then on the exhalation, they might contract. So they're actually moving ever so slightly. And you might first find your hands have to find the breath. And then your breath might actually kind of follow your hands. But you can just literally look for something comfortable. What is comfortable, I hear you say. We don't often ask, what can I endure? We're much more endurance people. But actually, if you said, What's a comfortable rhythm? This one actually, traditional origins are more in Qigong than anywhere else, but it's been borrowed by the trauma sensitive practitioners. Sometimes it's a little much to ask people to tune into their bodies when they've got pain and struggles with their health, but often the hands can be more neutral or the feet. I don't know how you move your feet in time with your breath, but maybe you need to be sitting down for that. But, you know, just play with it. And look, as soon as you're ready, just drop your hands again. It's just a little kind of option. I'm just giving you options. And then there's this other option, which, I don't know, maybe my client group is just really kind to me, but a lot of them have told me this really helps them. So I'm just sharing it with you just in case it's useful. So compassion kindness, hand holding, you know, when someone holds our hand, we often, well, there's actually really good evidence that our hand is held, our pain regulations better, especially if it's someone we love. 
but you know, sometimes I'm on the bus and <laughs> there isn't someone to hold my hand. And it's really awkward if you just say to the person next to you, do you mind? I'm going to an appointment, I'm really nervous. And they're like, ooh, no, hold hand. So two hands, this is the only way I can teach it. It's my back to you, sorry folks. Left hand, right hand grabs the thumb and wraps, right? So try this with me. Pick up the pointer finger on the right hand and then wrap that. And then drop your hands into your lap. Don't make your knuckles white. We're not, we're not trying to strangle our fingers and thumbs. Just, you know, see how that feels. And if it doesn't suit you, leave it here. And if you want to, Take it with you. You might want to hold on for the next ride. Oh, just worth saying, compassion, self-compassion, the Dalai Lama is completely confused as to why we have different words for them. He's like, isn't it all the same? That's how they kind of are cultured. We're cultured into some distinction, but, you know, that's modern Western culture. But I just wanted to say, you recognise what I mean when I say we often treat people, other people with more kindness than we offer ourselves. So we're just looping ourselves in here. We're just saying need to be included in the kindness and don't worry, that's not all about being all fluffy and nice. Some of the best compassion is fierce. Kristen Neff started writing about this. She says it's like the yin and the yang. You've got the soft one that's kind and then you've got the fierce one that's really determined. It really gets stuff done, cuts through the crap. And together, keep holding with me. These practices can become a container, a container so that we can turn towards, so we can befriend ourselves and our difficult emotions. We can let things arise and let things fall away. Because I think it's worth acknowledging that one of the things that's in this room this morning is some really tender topics, some tender conversations, some emotions. And maybe we could turn towards this anticipatory grief. That's the grief which occurs before an impending loss. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is credited with the uh, five stages of grief model. You might know it. Don't worry, you don't have to, it's not prescriptive. You don't have to go through the stages in order. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. <laughs> And by the way, her collaborator, David Kessler, went on to say, look, there's actually a sixth stage and it's about finding meaning. But when she first wrote her first article, like 1771, it was published and republished. The article was called, What's It Like to Be Dying? It was really actually about people facing the prospect of their own death. It wasn't just about people being left behind. It's become a model for those left behind, but it's actually, it's about the stages we go through when we suddenly realise, oh, Time is short. And a um, couple of quotes from the article. She describes the way in which patients will go from no, not me, through to perhaps asking why me, and yes me, but, to the simple yes me, why not me? And if we can be aware that these stages arise and fall away, we can accept and understand and, and maybe actually truly accept and be comfortable with them and help people with them because the most important thing, and this is the commentary on the article, was that they wanted to talk with someone. They wanted to say how they were feeling. Check. Yes. So anticipatory grief. This is a lovely quote from one of my clients. She said, I was so confused in my emotions till I heard the term anticipatory grief. And now that I know it's a thing, I know how to take care of myself when it shows up. But there's so many different ways it shows up. You know, it can be frozen in fear, unable to move, or you just might be tetchy and irritable and not sort of connect it with anything. But people talk about just wild fury and indignation and the injustice of it all. And yes, that's sometimes how it presents could be a deep disheartened feeling of despair and it's not sadness per se it's more existential than that but other people have said you know it's the sweet pang the the sharp pang of bitter sweetness as you taste joy and then think oh is that for the last time 
And some people have told me that they have a stronger sense of their place in the circle of life. It's a hard thing to kind of reconcile, but actually a beautiful thing. Maybe that's why they broke the Lion King. I don't know. So there's this sense also available of being enlarged and open at the same time as feeling insignificant as a tiny blue dot. Have you seen that Carl Sagan clip? You know, when he zooms out, and it's just this tiny dot with all the people who've ever lived and all the people who are ever going to live and us right on the dot of the universe. And he zooms out like into the distant space and it's just a tiny, tiny dot. And it's like, oh, oh okay. I guess I don't have to worry about all those um, to-do lists right now as much if I've uh, got that perspective. And you might want to keep holding because it really only makes sense. If we've got a strong connection to life, and I think that's one of the nice things is I meet people with strong connections to life, then we're going to experience strong feelings into, in relation to anything that threatens that, either indirectly or directly. And it really isn't just the prospect of life coming to a close. It's all the intangible losses. It's the loss of one's sense of security, future, dreams like seeing children become parents or grandparents. And as one of my lovely, lovely clients said to me, she said, I was trying so hard to be positive about my treatment and my prognosis. I just didn't give myself permission to honour the losses I was feeling. And the first one was the loss of innocence. You know that one where you just can't be naive to the fact that, wow, we're only here for a little while. And why would we turn towards and not away? Look, don't get me wrong, it can be tempting to turn away and I completely respect people's right to do so at times. It's just really protective. You've got to get through a treatment period or something that's a major thing in your life that needs your focus, then, you know, we turn away. But if we turn away entirely from reality, we might miss something. And that's the opportunity for meaning and connection. It's opportunities for acceptance and the chance that it gives us for repair, forgiveness for ourselves, for others to make gestures of care towards people who might need them. So putting the essentials in order might free us up so we can just, you know, get on with the joy and the delight. And this is really vastly different from what I hear a lot. People tell me I'm worried if I do this acceptance, it might be seen as giving up or it might feel like giving up. But actually, it's really quite liberating. And I've put up here a book title, Catherine Mannix just published this year, Listen. This is about having those difficult conversations. She calls it how to find the words, the tender conversations. And it's beautiful. We just not always knowing how to go about it. One of my clients, I've, I've kind of put it into typing. This is originally on just a scribbly piece of paper. She said, I'm really confused. I've got this metastatic breast cancer. I've been told I've got treatment options. I, she said, I could live for quite a long time with this. And yet I don't know if I'll get very much time at all. And we tried to Think about what do you do in relation to if time is short or time could be longer. Well, well, she said, you know, you find the overlap. She said, you know, if time is short, I'm going to put some essential things in order. But then I'm just going to go and be with my loved ones. I'm going to go to the beach. That was her favourite place. Forgive, hug. And she said, as time is longer, I'm still going to be with my loved ones and go to the beach. I'm just going to go more. I'm still going to hug people, more hugs. So in a way, she just kept finding the overlap, the thing that was about what her life was about. And I love this quote from Kerry. She said, when I started to open up to my sadness about not having more time, it seemed to allow my three young adult children to open up too. I'm so glad to still be here now to comfort their grief, share my own, leave them with my vote of confidence about how they will go forward without me. And as hard as it was, I want them to carry this message from me forever. Perhaps my grief will help them to have their own grief when the time comes. I meet a lot of very wise people because loss points to gain. And if you've got something that feels tender and sensitive, it probably means there's something that really matters to you, something you're glad of in life. 
What are you grateful for? What gives you your meaning? And this will be a unique answer to everyone. But can I just ask you to have a think? How do you translate this into your day? Because this is another quote from another client who said, I've started gathering up all the old family recipes and teaching the kids and grandkids my favourites. We've had a lot of fun and we've made a lot of memorable mess in the kitchen and all the recipes have handwritten notes on them now. It's a nice legacy, very tangible. Mary Oliver, I always love a poem. She helps us with this. I'm not a poet, so I borrow. She says, do you not have to be good? You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. And breathing because I'm going to invite you just to grab one thing, one thing to take with you, an idea, a thought, a practice. It could be the feeling of your feet on the ground and we'll just do a tiny practice because this is a tenderness and I think we need to honour it. So just grab your one thing and then let it dissolve. Feel your body supported by the chair, the breath breathing in the body and allow your attention to be at the front of you, perhaps on the cool air on your face or this clothing and fabric at the front of you and then allow your attention to move into the space in front of you and let it be inclusive of objects and obstacles so letting your attention move out incrementally into the space in front of you and out even beyond this room, beyond the building and out into the world, just a sense of spaciousness at the front. And breathing. Now let your attention be at the back of you. The air on the skin, the chair, and the space that is immediately at the back of you, extending out through the room, out beyond the room and into the world. And breathing. And now the space of the sides, the left and the right, immediately close to the body and then extending outward. out into the room, beyond the room, and out into the world. Space at the sides and breathing. And let the spaces meet the sides, the back, the front, above and below. Like a three-dimensional sphere of space without a fixed edge, just expanding out all around and in it, centered, grounded. You can be breathing. Just taking another full breath cycle in the spaciousness. Breathing in. I know that I'm breathing in and breathing out. I know that I'm breathing out. And even as you let the imagination 
dissolve and just come back into the room, a sense of where you are, what you're taking with you, my deep appreciation for you in being here with me to practice, to find some of the things that mindfulness and uh, self-compassion offer us. Because I think when we cultivate mindfulness with a compassion that is inclusive of us and extends to others, then we can meet with even the most difficult aspects of the human condition and we can keep connected to the joys that are available in life. Thank you to the folk who've mentioned the abundance of websites and uh, apps available. There's a few book titles I recommend listen. With the end in mind, there's a little more heavy going on the tissue box. And uh, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Sarah. That's so I'd just like to thank Christina. I think that was um, a really good um, point to end on. Hopefully everybody's feeling okay with everything that's been, been covered today. Just a couple of quick things before everybody goes. Thanks to everybody attending in person and online. I hope you've all got something out of it. If there are any questions that are submitted to the chat line, these will be answered either by the speakers or by the breast cancer care um, team. Um, there will be a survey sent out this afternoon. If you could fill that in, that's great, but, and it helps us plan future events. Um, I'd really like to thank Novartis Pharmaceuticals who put on the food and helped with all the organizing and to Emily who did all the running around, um, to all the speakers for giving up their time and the IT guys, despite that little blip just towards the end, it's all hopefully fingers crossed worked out well. And as we said, it will be available online. If anybody